Good morning. I hope you guys are doing great. Thank you for joining us. We've got an incredible set of panelists here. These are industry titans who effectively run this region's grid. I'm going to introduce them in a second, but we are here today, dearly beloved, to talk about the role utilities play in energy transition, the opportunities ahead of them, the super long poles in the tent challenges that they're facing, in a panel that we're calling how utilities are navigating the energy transition. So what good looks like is you've got a crisper sense of how these folks are viewing their role inside this complex mix of decarbonization, renewables, massive electrification and build out, how they see themselves as stewarding those changes, captaining the, the divisions between different stakeholders and trying to smooth those out. And then we're gonna turn the conversation over to you and have, give you an opportunity to pick up the mic and have a conversation with these folks. So we'll start, we'll run through some questions that we have been thinking about that we think will be relevant to you. But first I want to, to give you a sense of who is here, these fine, fabulous folks. We've got Diane Leopold, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Dominion. You might have caught her keynote earlier. It was absolutely outstanding. Kendall Bowman, who's the President of Duke, North Carolina, and Clay Reichard, who is the Vice President for Systems Planning for Southern. Together, these three run companies that will affect the health and wealth, grid stability, business operations, for millions and millions of customers and set in motion decarbonization that will affect lives and livelihoods for millions, right? They are, they are at the helm of change and we're gonna talk about their responsibilities for it. But first I want a context set. So we've had a few speakers here. No one has really characterized yet the climate context. So let me just do that in a few short words. 2023 was the hottest year on record. It blew all records away by a long shot. January blew those records out of the water. Spring has come two weeks early. Right now, we have the highest concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, more than we've had in two million years. The rate of warming is going faster over the last few decades than it has in two millennia. We are putting the equivalent of five Hiroshima bombs every second into the ocean of warming energy every second, every day, every year, year after year. And we have got to bend that curve. We've got to move urgently. We've got to move at scale. And utilities are at the heart of those changes. A roughly 80% of climate change activities runs through utilities. Why? How? We've got to double the size of our grid by 2030. We've got to reduce emissions by 2030 by 80%. That's a heck of a lot of work. What do we need to do that? We've got to quadruple the amount of renewables. We've got to triple the amount of transmission lines. That's millions of miles of lines that move and wheel that power that have got to be reconducted or strung up net new. And it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be cheap or cheerful. We're facing massive interconnect backlogs. We've got more than twice the capacity sitting in the queue for power waiting to be connected to the grid than we have in all of the grid. Electrification, which has been totally stable for the last few decades, is on a hockey stick-like growth. PJM, the largest regional grid in the country, it's about from Illinois to Virginia, says they are going to need the size of another New York by 2030 in terms of net new capacity. Diane talked about Data Center Alley in Northern Virginia. It's, as she said, the largest data center concentration of power on the planet, and it's larger than the five next concentrations of data centers combined. They doubled their capacity from 2018 to 2023. They're gonna double it again by 2028. We have got massive electrical surge, and the way to decarbonize, energy transition flows through electrification of absolutely everything. We've got to rewire America. That means on the grid side, doing those things I talked about, reconducting lines, quadrupling the size of renewables. But on the customer side, we've got to deploy about a billion machines from vehicles, from stoves, from cooking, from cooling. None of those things self-install. None of those things they're replacing uninstall themselves. 
So this is going to take a World War II-like mobilization to get the job done, to deploy the infrastructure, to make sure that our utilities are building renewables, interconnecting clean and green power, both utility scale and distributed. They've got to make sure the grid is digital, it's intelligent, so that we can flexibly balance, so we don't have to overbuild. We can control between our grid operators and our customers. We need to make sure that we are decarbonizing as absolutely fast as we can and decommissioning coal, bringing in CCUS, bringing in renewable natural gas, green hydrogen where we can, and we need to do it fast. But we've got a whole host of nimbyism, a whole host of permitting delays. Who is going to pay for the costs of wildfires? Utilities? Customers? Taxpayers? The government? So there's fundamental tensions in the utility business model. Some utilities are having a hard time being solvent. You've seen Hawaiian Electric and PG&E face bankruptcy challenges in the face of catastrophic climate change. That keeps utility executives, like my friends here, up at night. And we're gonna talk about what they do to sleep soundly, what really keeps them up at night, and what the road to net zero looks like. So we're gonna start our conversation. We're gonna give you a chance to jump in, but let's begin. So. My friends, Kendall, Clay, Diane earlier told us what Dominion's doing with energy transition. She laid out her role. Dominion is putting up a wind, offshore wind uh, site that is going to be the largest in the history of these United States with CBAO. It's extraordinary. So we know you guys have big plans in the works. Would love to hear what your energy transition strategies are at Duke, at Southern, and how you are moving through in terms of your status and your progress towards those goals. I want to turn it over to Kendall first. Sure. Make sure this is on. There we go. There we go. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. It's exciting to be here. Um, Gee, I don't know if I can follow all of that, Molly. <laughs> uh, you know, at, at Duke Energy, we have been on a clean energy transition for quite a while now. So I will start with, um, we've already reduced our carbon emissions by 46%. Uh, and we are still in the midst of that transition. And North Carolina, I think, is really a leader uh, in the country on the clean energy transition. They passed uh, bipartisan legislation in 2021. It was called House Bill 951 that really put North Carolina on that path to net zero by 2050 and some in interim goals by 2030, trying to get to that 70% by 2030. So Duke Energy is really working hard to get there. Um, we filed an updated integrated resource plan last August. Uh, we are seeing tremendous growth in North Carolina, economic growth. I think you heard Senator Tom Tillis, if you were in this last session, talk about how North Carolina is number one for business two years in a row. Um, it, the growth is just astounding between population and then economic development from federal uh, policy. Think about IRA, IIJA, the Infrastructure Jobs Act, the Tax Reduction Act, the onshoring. We're seeing battery manufacturing, Chips and Science Act. We're seeing that coming to North Carolina. But we're also seeing technology as well. So think about artificial intelligence, data centers, and they need a lot of power. So we're seeing all of this economic growth, so much so that even though we filed a resource plan in August, we saw so much growth, we had to update that plan just this January to accommodate for all of this growth that's coming. We want to continue to see North Carolina be the great economic growth state that it is. People love to come to North Carolina to live. It's a fantastic place to live. We want to be a part of that. So the challenge that we have at Duke Energy is to ensure we continue down this path of the clean energy transition, while at the same time meeting that, that new growth demand, but also ensuring that we have affordable, Rates, you know, that's one of the things that attracts people to North Carolina from an economic development standpoint is the price of power. In North Carolina, we were well below the national average and we have been for many decades. We'd love to keep it that way, 
But as you make this transition to clean energy, it comes at a cost when you have to build so many new resources to meet that growing demand. And then the other parameter that we always have to care about at the utility is reliability. Keeping the lights on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so trying to fit those puzzle pieces together of that clean energy transition, meeting the growth, also while ensuring reliability and affordability, I think that's, that's kind of the transition that Duke Energy is focusing on. Thank you. Clay? Thanks, Molly, and that was a fantastic introduction, by the way. Um, you, know, you asked about our fleet transition strategy, and so let me talk about our four pillars, but, but let me first talk about our net zero goals. So we have uh, a 50% reduction goal by 2030 and net zero by 2050. And much like Kendall, we're, we've already achieved 45-plus um, percent reduction, and we expect to hit our 2030 goal uh, by 2025, so a full five years early. And so what are our four pillars of our strategy? How did we get here, and how do we expect to get to net zero? Well, the first one is we're committed to retiring uh, our coal fleet. Uh, we've had 66 coal units in 2007. We're down to 14 today. So we retired 52 units so far. And we expect to be uh, around six by the mid to late 30s. Uh, the second pillar is a significant investment and expansion in renewable generation. Uh, we're at three gigawatts or 3,000 megawatts of solar right now. Uh, we're forecasting to be at 10,000 megawatts by 2035. Uh, the third one is invest investment in new technology, new carbon-free technology. You may have seen that we've uh, got the first nuclear unit in the last 30 years online uh, last year and hope to have Vogel 4 on next year. We're very excited about that. That, is, that represents 2,200 megawatts of base-loaded carbon-free energy. And so it's going to take more of those type of investments. You mentioned CCS, uh, hydrogen storage, et cetera. So we're committed to investing in and pursuing those technologies. But then the last one is uh, gas. Natural gas has got to be part of the fleet transition. Kendall talked about reliability, affordability, and sustainability to maintain reliability, but to also help integrate renewables, we're going to have to have gas capacity in this country. So those are our four pillars of our fleet transition strategy. Thank you, team. I appreciate that. I'm going to turn to the role of utilities in energy transition. Diane, if those of you who were at the keynote earlier talked about what she wishes for, and the path forward, and she said the path forward has got to be one that has all parties march into the same drum, beat of music, and that's really hard when you have misaligned incentives between your renewable developers, your utilities, your state and federal regulators. All of these utilities operate in different states, across many states, and each state is a different animal in the zoo with unique special flowers of focus, and you've got to be attentive and attuned to that. And then, of course, you've got your customers and you've got your energy transition advocates. Not everybody is on the same page at all times, and not having that kind of alignment creates stagnation or at least slows progress towards goal. And so. What is the utility's role in energy transition for Dominion, for Duke, for Southern? Is it your job to proactively align the parties that are misaligned? Is it your job to be a thought leader and show people the path? How do you view it within your respective companies? Diane? Uh, sure. So uh, I would say all of the above. You know, we, we need to play a role. We need to be a thought leader. We need to participate in the process. And we do have to appreciate that every state is very different. You know, in the electric service territories, we have a, a small amount in North Carolina, not nearly as much as Kendall here, but uh, very large in Virginia and in South Carolina. The state policies in you know, not having that cohesive national energy policy. We have to work within the framework of what's acceptable. But meanwhile, all of us participate in net zero commitments, and really the whole industry participates in net zero commitments. So we have industry-wide, we have national goals, and then we're trying to fit it in and participate within the context. But more broadly also, these as an 
energy utility and electric utility, of course we need our own transition plan to decarbonize and to meet our net zero commitments and to try to transition the fleet and meet those demand growth needs. But we're also there to help support and make it easier for other industries to decarbonize. They're looking for electrification, so that puts that extra pressure on us. And meanwhile, I kind of find it interesting because when most people think of utilities, they don't think of uh, an R&D company. Really? <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> and yet, we're really out there piloting a lot of new technologies that the R&D companies are developing those technologies, but to be able to deploy it at scale, it's going to rely on utilities. So I think we have a very broad role to play. Kendall, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I would agree with everything Diane said. I mean, I, I think it is an all of the above. Um, we, have to, we have to all be in this together. Um, I would like to just focus a little bit on we've got to get community specific. And that is something that we're focused on at Duke Energy. Um, it really gets down to the local, local level. Um, you look at it statewide, statewide policy, and then federal policy. But as we're you know, building out new generation or retiring coal plants, um, we have to think about the communities that we're in. We have to partner um, with the, those communities, with the stakeholders. We have to be in it together. One of our prioritizations is we call it retire and replace. So in those communities where we're retiring coal plants, we're planning to replace it with, with new generation there. Um, I'll take example, Person County, which is not far up the road here. It's in Roxboro. We've had coal plants there. I think they were built in 1966. Um, we have been a partner in that community. We employ over 250 people there. We are about 20% of the tax base in Person County. And if we were to retire and just leave, that puts that county in, in a bad position. So we're really working with that county. We're looking at replacing it, um, some of those coal units with some natural gas, uh, hydrogen capable natural gas, but also looking at solar battery storage in that area as well. Um, so we can't forget the communities and the stakeholders, and I think it's really all of us working together. Not everybody's going to agree, but being open and talking and having that communication, hopefully we can come up with solutions to help us on this clean energy journey. You know, while you're right, there, there's lots of different opinions, different interests, and sometimes they're conflicting, but I think uh, what I feel is Southern Company and our state regulators, we are aligned. And we're aligned that the customer is at the center of everything we do. And our goal is to provide them clean, safe, reliable, and affordable energy. Uh, and so it is our role, along with our regulators, to f meet those goals, to provide our customers those four things. It is difficult. And I do think it's going to take a little bit of a village to get there. We talked about R&D. Um, we're spending a lot of money uh, and, and time on new technologies. Tall wind. We're looking at going all the way up to 110 meters to see if we can get adequate resource to pay for that cost of taller wind. We're looking at CCS. We're investigating hydrogen. Um, and it is going to take all of those. It's going to take a portfolio approach to get there. But it's also going to continue to require constructive regulation, a national energy policy, and maybe even some of our customers come along beside us. This is an unscripted question, but you've all mentioned national energy policy at this point. Do you foresee that happening in the next decade? You can choose not to answer. <laughs> I remain optimistic. I'm very hopeful. Um, I think there's all, all obviously challenges um, right now at the current state of um, our government, uh, but I remain hopeful. And, and one thing I'm particularly interested in is and I'm probably getting ahead of myself a little bit here, but there's a lot of first-of-a-kind risk out there. I'm a, obviously a big proponent of nuclear. I've already bragged on Vogel 3 and 4. I think base-loaded, carbon-free, firm dispatchable solutions are absolutely integral to getting us to net zero. But it's going to, again, require a village and policy and help for us to set off on that path again. Amen to that. Did you know that first-of-a-kind's acronym is FOLK? <laughs> and that people use folk 
on the regular. It's, it's amazing. Pioneers right here. We're folking the largest offshore wind <laughs> plant in the country. Um, team, I'm going to move to some of the longest poles in the tent, some of the things that might keep folks up at night. I mentioned a whole host of them. I don't even think I mentioned the silver tsunami that's coming. 50% of utility workers on average across the country are eligible to retire. One person um, uh, quipped to me, and, and forgive me, that we are one silver-haired engineer's retirement away from a blackout in certain states. And so we've just got, it, I, I mentioned interconnect cube, spiking data centers, the resurgence of manufacturing drawn by the federal stimulus that are really just like taking utilities by surprise. Clay, I think you guys uh, doubled your, your IRP, like in, in super short order, the, the forecast for demand and the assets they would need to satisfy that. So I'd love each of you to give us your top three bogeys, the, the things that keep you up at night, and then help us understand, because there are many. This could, be, this could be the rest of the day if we just talked about challenges, so I wanna, but I want to get to optimism. So top three things that, that are, you are focused on in terms of obstacles to energy transition and achieving our net zero, your net zero goals, um, and the things you think that would be required to address them. Okay, sure. I'll uh, I'll start, I, and I will say with respect to your, I, I hadn't heard silver tsunami, but you know the utility of the future is not the same as the utility in the past, and because of the new technology and because of the excitement of participating as being part of the solution to climate change, I think we're going to attract a lot of new workers that will replace the silver-haired engineers that... Uh, Diane's call to action, join the utility. <laughs> there you go. Um, but, you know, in the, the long pole in the tent, I will just give the entire bucket of infrastructure. So what it takes to actually transition to a carbon-free future and accept all of the demands of our customers and, and the needs for reliability, resiliency, demand growth. So just in the next five years, we'll be investing $43 billion. And to be able to do that successfully, you know, we talked in the last uh, talk that I gave an hour ago that an electric transmission line five, seven, ten years to be able to build it. Offshore wind we've been developing for a decade. We can't move at that pace and be successful. You gave the climate goals that you talked about. So in getting the capital, in getting technology deployed, and in getting the permitting would be my three, all related to successfully deploying the infrastructure. And, and I'm not going to solution here on the fly, but getting the capital, does that mean like private market needs to lean in and do public private? Do you need financing from the, the federales? What, what do you? Well, it's actually exactly what, what we talked about in terms of risk sharing, first of a kind risk. Uh, you know, a, a public company can't just, it, you need the support of some type of risk sharing methodology. It can come from federal energy policy. It can come from consortium. It can come from you know large customers or but there has to be some structures to be able to support the capital. It's one thing to be able to raise capital as a large public company, but to do that on top of a lot of risk large risks such as large nuclear facilities or large offshore wind, it takes a certain amount of risk sharing that we need to try to solve through various methods. Kendall. Sure, and um, I have a lot of the same worries that Diane has. Um, you know, if we look at the, the load growth that's potentially coming um, and the recent updated resource plan that we filed, over the next decade and a half to two decades, in the Carolinas, because we serve North and South Carolina together at Duke Energy, we're looking at doubling the size of our resources. So today, we operate 30,000 megawatts of generation on the system. In the next decade and a half to two decades, we're going to need another 30,000 megawatts to serve the needs and to meet the clean energy transition. Um, so, you know, part of that's retiring 
coal, although we've retired most of the coal in our system. Um, so ensuring that we can actually get there in the time frame um, and all of the things that Diane mentioned, uh, you know, it's going to take a lot of capital. Uh, it's going to take a lot of advanced technology. It's going to take a lot of things that we haven't even invented or created yet to help us get to that net zero. So it's really a balancing act also because at the same time, I mentioned affordability. You know, can we do this and keep rates affordable for everybody? And can we make this transition and ensure that we have a reliable system? You know, in the United States, we are fortunate. We have an extremely reliable electric grid. You go other places in the world and it's not so reliable and it's something that we've all become accustomed to. Um, and we wanna ensure that we have that going forward. So those, those are really the things, you know, in terms of the workforce, you know, I think it's something that we're, we're all thinking about. Um, we are working closely with our community college systems and our universities in the Carolinas. We got great universities right here. Um, but you know, we've got to, I think, get the message out there that there is going to be a need. And as Diane said, it's a different need than what we've had in the past and what we currently have today. Um, but I do want to put out a, a plug. We're getting ready to have, every year we have a line worker rodeo. Um, and they compete against each other at Duke Energy and then they go into the International Lawn Workers Rodeo and that's gonna be this, this Saturday. But I'll put it in a plug for, you know, not college educate, we need all workforce levels to make this work because as we're building transmission, we need people to build and string the transmission lines. We need people to work on the distribution grid, to work, build the substations, um, to build the power plants, to build the solar facilities, the wind farms, there's going to be a tremendous need, but it's an exciting time to be in this industry. So I just want to leave the students with, it, it's exciting. Uh, you can help be a part of the solution and come up with new ideas for us. You're already jumping to my optimism part. Stay negative. This is the challenges. This is the tensions part, okay? I got a lot of things that keep me up at night. I'll try and narrow it down to three. Um, firm, dispatchable, carbon-free capacity. That's number one. Transmission is number two, and affordability number three. Let me talk quickly about all three. Um, I talked about Vogel, 2,200 megawatts of carbon-free firm dispatchable capacity. I get people come up to me a lot of times saying, you know what, I got the solution for this fleet transition thing. You guys should just build all solar. And I'm like, well, but what about when the sun doesn't shine and the battery is out? You know, we, we have to have capacity. Our customers expect reliability and if we don't provide reliability we lose license to go do these other things that are important so capacity solutions transmission we have to have transmission to allow the penetration of more renewables but also to serve this growth transmission takes a long time to build we've got to go acquire land there's supply chain constraints and the way our model works right now is you usually don't go build the transmission until there's a generation or load commitment but by the time you go build the transmission, it's too late. And then number three, affordability. You know, the large majority of our customers make less than $50,000 a year. And you thought about Georgia, if I could just take a minute to brag on that. Um, in, in the state of Georgia, in the last, in that 18 month time frame, we saw our winter peak load forecast for 2030 go up 6,600 megawatts. It's the equivalent of six Vogel units that went up in 18 months. Vogel is the nuclear plant that he's talking about in Georgia. Thank you. And so we have gone to our commission um, with an IRP update to go meet that growth. And it is an all of the above solution. It's got power purchase agreements, it's got solar, it's got batteries, uh, and it's got new natural gas. And it's also got distributed energy resources and demand response. So it's, it's all the arrows in the quiver. Um, and we're also gonna do that and put downward pressure on rates for our customers. So it is scary, it's complicated, this growth at the same time we're trying to transition the fleet. But I think where there's also a really neat opportunity if we do it right right now, then we can achieve all these three things at the same time. Again, with the optimism, I'm not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thank, thank you. 
let's go to some of the optimism in terms of opportunities that, that are fairly unprecedented. So over the last few years, we've seen a triple play of federal spending that no other country continent creed has ever been able to match. It's historic by every measure. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act was $1.2 trillion, primarily in grid, transportation, infrastructure, passed in November of 2021. The CHIPS Act is a semiconductor act. It's, it's primarily to make sure that we've got the right kind of onshore American production capacity to power a lot of our clean energy futures and our, our digitization. And then lastly, the most historic climate bill in the history of the world of any other country is the Inflation Reduction Act, what we call the IRA. It put $370 billion to work, $370 billion to work. And let me tell you the, the, the upside of all of this for the grid. In IIJA, there was $80 billion invested in grid upgrades. So resiliency and smart grid, electric vehicles, CCUS, that's carbon capture and sequestration, hydrogen, grid hydrogen hubs all over. In the Inflation Reduction Act, that has put hundreds of billions in tax credits, grants, and federal lending authority to reduce carbon emissions. And only after a year of passage, we've seen $240 billion of private capital commitments, 8x what the IRA public dollars were, just to onshore to make sure we could produce the electric vehicles, the batteries that power them, and all the pieces, parts of industrial decarbonization. So it's been fairly extraordinary. And so my question, friends, my question is, how has this historic funds, it just, and for everybody's benefit, the IIJA has about 80 billion that, that is grid oriented. The IRA is mostly non-utility oriented. So it does have investment and production tax credits for renewable developers. And so an unregulated part of the utilities business could capture that, but it's primarily utilities, IIJA, private market, green developers, uh, IRA, right? For EV tax credits and consumers to actually buy the climate tech. How are those, those triple plays of historic funding affecting or have affected your thinking? Is it marginal? Is it fundamental to the core strategy? Just give us a sense of what you're doing to either think about, capture, or help your partners capture these dollars. Diane? Um, sure, so I would put it in two buckets. And uh, one of the things that IIJA has done is, you know, you apply for grants as a utility and you can, so uh, one of the ones we're doing, it helps support some technology pilots. And so it helps, if you get some of these, it helps support risk sharing as technology is developing and it helps keep customer bills down and it helps accelerate some of the technology. That's wonderful. I will still say that given the level of investment we need, that is still on the margin. When it comes to the IRA, I will say that we, while we haven't applied for the grants ourselves, the counties, the states will you know, apply to get electric school buses and those types of things. So it really does help support decarbonization, can help keep bills down across the board as we move to decarbonize, but personally, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a game changer in the actions that we need to take for the energy transition. Kendall, how is Duke thinking about it? So, you know, I will say we're, like Diane, thinking about the IIJA to help try to reduce customers' bills where we can, um, where we see kind of, you know, we're thinking about smart grid technologies that we're deploying across the system, some transmission lines needed to connect more renewables to the system, and can we get some of that federal funding to help reduce, reduce the price? Um, is it gonna be significant enough to move the needle tremendously? Maybe not tremendously, but every dollar helps, right? So we're really trying to take advantage of those where we can, and we're trying to partner with our state energy office on projects because not all of these are available to the utilities, but we can help partner and help the states, co-ops, municipalities try to try to get dollars as well. On the investment tax credits, um, actually that is a big thing for Duke Energy, and I'll, I'll explain why. So we operate the largest regulated nuclear fleet in the country, here in the Carolinas for Duke Energy, and the tax credits we get production tax credits 
for that nuclear fleet. So those nuclear production tax credits will be a significant benefit to our customers. I'm talking hundreds of millions, potentially billion dollar benefit to our customers here in the Carolinas. So we, that, we see that as pretty impactful um, and we'd love for that to be able to stay in place. So on the demand side, I think all three have contributed to this explosive growth we're seeing. So, so I think that's one uh, outcome. Um, we do this thing called expansion planning, where we have this, for the my fellow nerds in here, um, we have this thing called a production cost model, and we, we have a view of the world, load forecast, fuel forecast, et cetera. And, and then we feed in these generic expansion units to say, what is the most economic fleet for our customers that maintains reliability. And when we modeled the ITCs and the PTCs, the IRA, it had a significant impact on that expansion plan. Uh, the, the model wants to pick more solar, more batteries. We see wind coming into our expansion plan when it had not before, and we see new nuclear coming in. Um, the other significant change was the PTC that was provided for solar. It had only been an ITC before now. It gives the regulated utility an opportunity to participate in solar ownership. And then it also provided that opt-out provision for ITC normalization on the batteries. And so again, huge cost savings for our customers for us to go now develop and own and operate batteries and solar. I love it. You were talking about technology just now, so let's talk about optimism with respect to tech. There are so many new things coming down the pike, both on the utility scale side, the behind the meter customer side. Diane talked about long duration storage and the pilots that you guys are, are doing right now with, with Rust. Uh, Iron Air is just, it's, it's, it's the sexiest, coolest thing, and I never thought I'd say that about Rust. But you've got generation level technologies, you've got these things called grid enhancing technologies like dynamic line rating, it, effect, it effectively head fakes the wire into thinking it's bigger than it actually is. So it can bring up to 30, 40% more renewables down that wire, down the pipe, if you will. So without having to reconduct the line or build more renewables, right? So the technologies are there on the transmission and distribution side. And obviously there's virtual power plants that actually can help you balance and control load, aggregate load behind the meter and send it back over to another facility or back to the grid. So. I'd love to ask each of you in, in kind, and what I'm gonna do is I'm going to ask you to talk about the technologies you're most excited about, but Diane, I'd love to, for you to talk about generation. And Clay, I'd love for you to talk about transmission and distribution, because you are the VP of systems planning. And then Kendall, you are a, a customer lady at heart, and I'd love for you to talk about innovations at the heart of the customer, because look, there, there was a, the biggest technology conference for utilities just happened a few weeks ago. It's called Distributech down in Orlando. The biggest things coming out of that were artificial intelligence is going to blow your mind, knock your socks off. There will be no socks after this. Gen AI, as we've talked about, is absolutely doubling the intensity of data center needs. So we've got to get a handle on it. And then customer experience. Customers want to go green. They will pay more for it, but they will not suffer for it if everything is siloed. If I've got an app for every single thing and nothing talks to each other, it's fragmented, it's a pain, and it's the too hard to do pile, and I'm not gonna pick up what you're putting down. So customer experience and artificial intelligence on the customer side, not that I'm leading the witness, Kendall, um, were the biggest things coming out of distributed tech. So I'd love to understand how each of you in your respective roles and in your companies are thinking about embracing technology to advance your, your net zero energy transition goals. My friend Diane. Okay, thank you. That was quite the lead up. <laughs> I love it. So, so in focusing on generation, there's so many different steps to it because like you said, rust, I just love technologies that, you know, we talked earlier about salt, you know, what are the technologies that are out there that can really help energize getting better batteries, getting cheaper or more effective solar panels, what kind of materials can make it more effective. So there's an entire uh, technology that's emerging around getting the renewables. You know, the renewables that we have two six megawatt pilot turbines that are, uh, that before we did the large offshore wind, we put in two six megawatt ones. 
those six megawatt ones, the ones we're now putting in are almost 15 megawatts each. So when you can actually deploy a turbine at, that is twice the size or three times the amount of generation capacity, people don't think of that as new technology because it's still just a wind turbine or it's still just a solar panel or it's still just a battery. So that's a whole area of emerging technology that is so important to try to keep things moving while more longer term technologies, the green hydrogen, the advanced nuclear reactors, you know, people are talking again about fusion and those types of carbon-free solutions that could energize the long term to get to that kind of carbon-free grid, net zero uh, economy across everything. So th the longer term is green hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, and all of the different types of nuclear technology, starting with small modular reactors that are kind of downscaled versions of the kind we have now, moving to more advanced that are more dispatchable and more flexible so that, you know, when a rainstorm comes, you know, you actually could just have one come on all the way to fusion. So those are the kind of longer range technologies, but I wouldn't discount some of the newer technologies that get us huge progress year after year that we're getting now. So if I could recap, you've got a mix of things that you're actively exploring, actively piloting, so that you can be ready for when something is ready to scale. Exactly. So we're doing all of those. So deploying those larger wind turbines and looking at the different solar technologies to get more out of the solar that we have, whether it's bifacial or putting certain kinds of ground material on that can be more reflective. We're doing all of those type, types of things now. We have done a green hydrogen pilot. It's small scale. It's going to take a while for that to be commercial at scale and we've looked at all of the technology providers for small modular reactors we've looked at all of the viable sites and we're actually looking at putting out a technology RFP soon to look at what kind of what are the best technology providers for phase one of that advanced nuclear I love that keeping your finger on the pulse I'm going to stick with grid because customer is the most important but we're going to we're going to come to save the best for last Kendall not that you're not the best. I'm not talk, talk, telling you you're not the best, Clay. You're, you're wonderful. Go on. So I can't talk about nuclear? You can talk about nuclear, but how, how are you integrating it with transmission <laughs> and distribution? No, I'm kidding. At TND, I, I'd, I'd, obviously, I'd go to DERMS and, and VPP, so Distributed Energy Resource Management System or Virtual Power Plant. Virtual Power Plant, in my mind, is just an evolution of your DERM system. And so I'm really excited. You know, we talk about distributed energy resources. We talk about thermostats, electric vehicles becoming generators. Those are all amazing things, and we need to lean into it. But they're not as useful and as valuable unless we can get three things. we got to get visibility, predictability, and controllability of those resources. And a robust DERM system that can go out there and grab those resources, aggregate them, give us visibility and controllability into those resources has tremendous potential. So what if we could take a neighborhood of EVs and it has a min and it has a max and it has a ramp rate and it's got ancillary services. It can provide regulation to the grid. It can provide reactive power to the grid. It starts to look like a virtual power plant. And that's what we need, and I think it's got tremendous value. And that's the technology that we're very active in right now. We are had an RFP out, and we're getting close to make a decision. I love that. But this comes to Kendall, so you can keep passing the mic. How do you get customers to agree with that? What's the customer experience have got to be? I'm just I'm walking you right into that one. So in terms of technologies on the customer side, how are you getting them to participate? How are you getting to lean in? It, really, it's it's about incentives. It's, it's giving the customers the right incentives, the right signals. Um, and that starts with being able to communicate with your customers, knowing how your customers like to communicate. And not all of our customers are exactly alike. Um, there's a big generational divide between our customers. Some customers still like paper bills. They like to communicate via paper. Some like the landlines, yes, people still have landlines. There are some that do. I would say the majority now really like 
cell phones, texting, really texting. Email, some people like to correspond email. So you really got to know your customers and you got to be able to communicate with your customers in all of those forums, but you need to incent them. They need to, to be incented to change their behaviors, um, to use less, less energy or to adjust when they charge their electric vehicles. So we're really trying to come up with creative rate designs, tariffs, the right incentive structures, but we're also looking at, we've been talking about artificial intelligence. Um, so we've got a whole IT team that's monitoring what's happening in the artificial intelligence world. Last year we deployed um, Chatbot uh, for our customer service. Um, so people, you know, I think many of you have seen it. You go online, depending upon which site you're on, and that's your, the first line of defense. You get the little box that pops up. How can I help you? And it's all artificial intelligence behind it. It's not a real person behind it. Um, so we're starting to use that on our website with customers. So customers can connect, disconnect, can sign up for programs and things like that using the chat bot. And that saves time and it saves costs. Um, but so we're trying to get creative and think of other ways that we can use artificial intelligence. I, I think we've, we've partnered with Amazon to help us perhaps with some flow analysis looking um, at our distribution lines all the way down to every feeder. Um, so really using that artificial intelligence where we can. We also have to be careful as well. I think we put in place a um, protocol or code of conduct on artificial intelligence within the company as well. It's new, I think everybody's wrestling with it, but I think it could open so many doors, uh, so many doors with our customers. And again, it's really about communicating with your customers, um, listening to them. Part of it is trying to figure out what do our customers want. Um, so hearing feedback from the customers, adjusting, but really doing the incentives. Thanks, guys. I appreciate that tour through that. I, there's so much that these folks are grappling with. There's so much they're trying to innovate around and unlock. What questions do you have for them? We've got about 10 minutes and then we're gonna we're gonna wrap so we've got some runners I'm gonna give my microphone up to my friend over here but my other other friend here yep grab that microphone raise your hand we've got a, one question down here and I'm just gonna give the microphone to you and bring it over to this gentleman right here or if you get there first sure there you go go ahead well thank you this has been a, a great session uh, Dave Conover with Kinder Morgan you talked about the intermittency of renewables, and currently that's dealt with by natural gas fired generation, fast ramping, and to a lesser degree, battery technology. If you look at decarbonizing that over the next 15 years, say, you've got a, couple, a few levers like RNG plus hydrogen blends, you've got better batteries, obviously, and you've got a CCS on natural gas uh, fire generation. Fifteen years from now, how would you rank the relative priority or contribution of each of those three tools? Can you take that? I'll make sure I got the three. Batteries, CCS, and the third one was? Gotcha. Um, sorry, one more question. By the way, I meant to say before we get into Q&A, uh, I filled out my bracket last night and I picked North Carolina to win it all. <laughs> He wants softball questions. So if that informs the difficulty of your questions, um, is this a uh, is this a new build decision I got to make, or is the infrastructure already in place? I say that because. All right, so, so don't hold me in those numbers, but I would say two primary players will be CCS and batteries with renewable gas playing a, a smaller part. Yeah, I just, the, the um, hydrogen holds great promise for the future, <clears throat> excuse me, for, um, for gas turbines right now, the existing technology can handle a blend but the new technologies could handle more. But if you're really looking at how do you optimize the existing fleet, we have a very large renewable natural gas program. We focus on uh, dairy and swine renewables, so the agricultural side. It 
is very small volumes that makes a really big impact because you're capturing methane. So I'm not discounting it at all, but in the context of what you're talking about in full amount of generation, I agree it's a relatively small amount, but from a carbon footprint, it does make a big difference. Carbon capture, it, the, the storage is a challenge. Yes. Got a question up in the front right here. And where's our, oh, oh, no, I was gonna hand the mic over, but we got a, we got a runner, so here we go. Um, thank you. I'm Steve Rao. I serve as a senior member of the city council, and I'm literally charged out by um, your your panel. I mean, the energy, especially the moderator, your passion. I want to take your energy and take it back to city hall. But <laughs> okay, uh, I'm a proud parent of a Tar Heel too. So um, one one in Carolina, one in state. But um, uh, real quickly, I guess I just want to do a do a follow up on growth. And you know, it is really exciting, exciting what I would call the a manufacturing renaissance that we're seeing taking place uh, in North Carolina. Uh, for those of us who are elected officials, it started with VinFast, the president was here last year uh, with Wolf Speed, we, many of us were there. Um, and then we got Forge Battery, which just announced in Morrisville with all the electric vehicles. And so, but with growth comes its challenges. I mean, just in Morrisville about a year ago, year and a, half, yeah, a year ago, our town was notified that we went from a 100, 100 megawatt load to 125 megawatt load just in the span of 18 months. And we're getting a lot of farm and life sciences. So, you know, and that's taking up a lot of power and water. Now, Duke Energy worked great with the partner. I mean, it wasn't nice that they put a substation in my neighborhood, but, but it worked out great. And they were very collaborative. I wanted to, want to give them a shout out. But my question is, how do we, how do we manage that growth? You know, how do, we, how do we deal with the fact that we're bringing all these manufacturing jobs here but also, isn't this an economic, we're gonna have a new governor a year from now. You know, if, we, if we're bringing in these companies, are we gonna have enough energy and power to, to create the, the opportunities for these jobs, or are we gonna continually put Duke Energy in a position where they can't keep up because there's just the load, and then, you know, there, there's so much load in that question, but if you could give me um, your observations that I could take back, that'd be great. Thank you. Well, I'm gonna ask the president of Duke, North Carolina, to weigh in on that one. Well, I think you summed up, you know, what keeps me up at night. Um, <laughs> the, the question is, uh, you know, I, I think we're going to all have to work together. We're all going to have to work together on that. Uh, you know, at Duke Energy, you know, our, our commitment is to work hard to try to serve all of the load that's coming. But I think it's going to take a partnership between the communities, uh, the state, state government, uh, the leaders, everybody working together um, to figure out how we do that. You know, with the bipartisan legislation, House Bill 951, it is up to the North Carolina Utilities Commission. The, the companies put together a resource plan. We put forward a plan. We put forward different scenarios on how to get there, different resource mix um, and timelines and of when we think we can get to that 70% uh, reduction and ultimately the net zero. Um, and we're going to work together. And the commission is is going to really set the the pace and the resources that we're going to deploy throughout the state. But I think we all have to work together. I mean, I wish I had a silver bullet solution for you, but I think it's going to take everybody working together. Thank you. Diana Clay, do you want to take that? Or is it North Carolina in question? But it's the, it's the central tension everywhere we go. Can you actually keep pace with the demand of the industry and the market with the grid that we've got? Yeah. I'm just going to echo it's going to require extremely co close coordination between the utility, their regulator, and the customer. The answer may not be no, it just may be not now. We may need to. Um, really map out the process. Because what can happen, manufacturing, not as much, but some of this load can manifest itself much faster than the needed infrastructure. If it takes me three, four, five years to build a generator and five to seven years to build a transmission line, but a data center can be online in two to three years, that's a problem. And so this just requires really close coordination. Yeah, we actually had a couple years ago to pause some new connects on data centers. And you got huge blowback from We that. did. You got huge blowback. We did, and, and we should, you yeah. know, that. but it was uh, as we were telling our regional uh, 
planning organization that where we operate our transmission grid that there is this demand is real yeah and but we can't build until it's in an official forecast and our regulators approve it and you go through it so we're, we're that's all in the rear view mirror we're staying ahead of it right now but it, it certainly is the question of the times and will be so for a while we've got time for two more questions let me see if there's anyone from yes ma'am and uh white oh, yes yeah okay um, can you bring her yes. This question is mostly for Clay, since you mentioned supply chain constraints. So with the explosive growth that's going on and the supply chain constraints, are you changing your supply chain processes at all to be able to keep up with it? Yeah, I think we have to. And, and it's pretty interesting. It's a dynamic situation. You know, I was a little worried about batteries and solar panels six months ago. I'm not as worried about batteries and solar panels right now. I felt good about my EPC position six months ago. I don't feel as good about my EPC position right now. Main power transformers, breakers, that's a very big concern. Those are long lead time items. So yes, and it's actually related to the previous question. And what I meant when I said not now, it just means we're gonna plan, we're gonna get you there, we're gonna serve the load, but it's gonna require coordination, but also us thinking about supply chain differently, getting in the queue earlier, creating some optionality in the queue and getting you know those order or those spots in the production line um, but knowing there might be a risk that if that load doesn't come to fruition we might have some material we got to go find something to do with so yes we're thinking about it uh, a little differently for sure we've got time for one last question i saw one in the back there the hands are up so yep scoot on over pass that mic yeah thank you for your question it, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you, you all mentioned um, having, uh, I, I guess, teams that are evaluating lots of new technologies, lots of new paths forward. Uh, as a company with an emerging enabling technology, what's the best way to engage and uh, um, find the right people to talk to? There you go. There's your pitch. Uh, so I will start. Uh, a few years ago, so we had... Um, we had an innovation group and we had a new customer uh, new business and customer solutions group and we merged those together so we have a group of people whose job it is to make sure that new technologies are out there we stay abreast of them we support pilots uh, that we kind of have an innovation center so uh, for Dominion Energy, it would run through our new business and customer solutions group who really, we kept them, we kind of separated them from the rest of our utility operations so they could be looking forward at solutions and working with our teams to integrate pilots. Yes, they're very similar. We have a robust R&D department. We have system planning. We're constantly looking at pre-commercial and commercial technologies uh, that can help help in this fleet transition. Uh, we invest in pilots. We do a lot of partnerships. And so, yeah, I think that would be the primary way to engage with us on that is through planning or R&D. We have a similar uh, group at Duke Energy that looks at new and emerging technologies. Um, we also do a lot with EPRI, which is the Electric Power Research Institute. Um, you know, and we, we do partners and pilot projects. We also do a lot of employee sharing. Um, so if you're thinking about new nuclear, advanced nuclear uh, ideas, we have employees that work at our nuclear plants that, that have gone to work for like Terra Power, um, really learning the new technology by employee sharing arrangements. So, um, but really, really reach out to our uh, advanced technologies group. Thank you for your questions, team. We're going to do one fast lightning round of final thoughts and reflections, the things that you should be taking away, walking away, talking about this at the water cooler, at your coffee break, at the happy hour. So these folks are going to leave you with one last word of inspiration. So I'm going to start. Clay's got the mic. Clay, a thought you're going to leave the audience with, their takeaway. Well, I hope if you heard anything, you heard the complexity of this problem we're trying to solve, maintaining 
clean, safe, reliable, affordable energy supply. It is very complicated. It's very challenging. The load growth is just making it even harder. Uh, however, I'll tell you, I had opportunity and the pleasure to meet Rosalind uh, before this. Uh, she's a student at Duke, not North Carolina, Duke. And she asked all these amazing questions, half of which I didn't understand and, or I, I couldn't answer because they were so good and difficult. And it was inspiring to me because I, I think I mentioned earlier, when we look at our path to net zero, that last 10 to 15 percent we know is going to require new technology. It's going to re require innovation and creativity. And so it just inspired me to hear the interest, to hear um, really smart people are interested in thinking about it. And I just hope that you all continue to lean in and help us because it's going to take, like I said earlier, a village to get there. I would leave with something similar. Uh, it is, I said it before, it's an exciting time to be in this industry. Uh, we are at the forefront of a transition, uh, an exciting time, and particularly in North Carolina, I think North Carolina has been the leader in clean energy. You think all the way back to clean smokestacks legislation, um, and then you know we had um, House Bill 589, and then we had House Bill 951. I think North Carolina is leading the charge in this, and what a better place to be um, than working at the utility and helping to come up with how are we going to meet this clean energy transition and serve the needs uh, and the economic development of the state. I think it's an exciting time, whether you, you're an accountant or somebody that's into IT, cybersecurity is huge right now. There are just so many different jobs that are at utilities right now. I just want people to keep an open mind. It's, it's, it's an exciting time. Uh, so the utility of the future is different than the utility of the past. And when utilities started, obligation to serve has not changed, but it was large power generating plant to large transmission line to distribution wire to home. But today you've heard of the amount of infrastructure that needs to be built that needs to marry with a huge number of emerging technologies that isn't all one way like that history was. You've heard about virtual power plants and you know vehicle to grid technology. So things are two way, distributed generation. So all of the different infrastructure that needs to get built tens upon tens of billions of dollars of infrastructure that needs to be built just with these three companies, let alone the rest of the country, to serve a decarbonized economy. So traditional utility meeting emerging technology. You heard it here, folks. It's complex, it's exciting, and it's urgent. So come partner, come be a part of this, come join these phenomenal folks in this industry. Thank you for your time. It's non-renewable. Climate change is real, and thanks for being part of the solutions for it. We hope you enjoyed today's session. We hope you are going to take away something and share it with your friends, your family, your peers. Thank you for your time, and have great days. And thank you to our incredible panelists. <laughs>